Okay. Welcome, everybody. It is 12 o'clock noon. Cassidy, can you give me a thumbs up if you can hear me and everything looks good? All right, Julia, thumbs up. Great. Awesome. Good afternoon, everybody. Happy Thursday. I think it's, yeah, it's afternoon, right? Well, it's noon, technically. Um, it's not even after. I'm Chris Hadfield. I'm the Executive Director of the Minnesota State Transportation Center of Excellence. And uh, we are going to do our annual supply and demand analysis for the 2023 transportation, transportation Pathways Overview. You know, every year we do this, and our great partners here are Julia and Aaron from Real Time Talent. And I want to thank them and Jenny and Deb and everybody at Real Time Talent for the extremely hard work and dedication, professionalism uh, for, for partnering with us on this great analysis. As usual, it is amazing work, and we really, and Catherine, and we really want to make sure that. Uh, we give them a significant amount of credit and questions, and they are, uh, I'll just I'll just be really frank, they are open for business for others to partner with and to, to take advantage of their great work. Uh, I also want to extremely uh, give, give an enormous thank you to Cassidy Jellen, our Transportation Center of Excellence Project Coordinator, who does all of the coordination and work and everything that you see to make sure that this and many other things at the Transportation Center go so smoothly and are so professional. And so thank you again, Cassidy, as well as our real-time talent team. So in Minnesota, as well as across the nation, we still have challenges with understanding the data behind supply and demand. We still have challenges with understanding when we write a grant, whether it's Perkins or National Science Foundation or others, well, what is the real gap? And we still have challenges with understanding, okay, well, if we have these trends, what do they look like? Because they're critical. And so I really encourage you to pay attention during this, but also know that we are closed captioning re and recording this, and we will be posting it to our YouTube channel, as well as the mintran.org uh, and later. And we will be able to download the, uh, the analysis. You can see in the chat that Cassidy put the link directly inside there. Um, there's gonna be some updated, uh, updated impacts based on COVID-19 and some foundational training skills, but make sure when you're taking a look at this and you're listening to this, that there are gonna be some things that are slightly different than last year. And there are gonna be some things that are, you're going to put that one eyebrow up and say, what did they just say? It's okay. It's okay. Trust me. There's there's a big deep dive into here. There might be some questions. We love that you're going to have questions later. And um, we we know that this data is critically important to you. So again, just make sure that you you go through it, listen to it, ask questions in the chat board. There are going to be some areas where you're going to say, Chris, come on, that number doesn't make any sense at all. Great. Awesome. Ask me, ask Julia, ask Aaron. Those numbers do make sense. We just maybe sometimes have to explain them a little bit more, right? Okay. So uh, I am very proud to say that uh, we're ready to hand it off to Aaron and Julia at Real Time Talent. And before we do, I just want to make sure that I acknowledge, um, again, my Transportation Center of Excellence staff, not just Cassidy, but Lou, Michaela, and Carl as well, who are all on the line, do an extraordinary amount of work. And um, whether it's outreach or program excellence or anything else, make sure that you take a look at our website, give us a call. And I also wanna acknowledge our Minnesota State campus, college campuses and partners, many of whom that are on the line across the entire state who do an excellent job day in, day out, and in the evenings too, and the weekends, that do an excellent job day in and day out, training and providing education and connecting our students, as well as our industry partners who are tirelessly, and I see several of you online right now listening, our industry partners who are tirelessly and always partnering with us, always saying yes, and always working really hard. And so we are super excited that you're not only on the line, but for even those of you that aren't on the line, we thank you from the bottom of our hearts because we couldn't do what we do without you. So uh, Aaron and, uh, and Julia, it is all yours. I will hit that mute button. Thank you again, everybody. Let's dig in. Thank you so much, Chris, and to the rest of the whole team at the Transportation Center of Excellence. Um, it really is such a pleasure to be here with all of you again for the fourth year in a row that we've been 
delivering these insights on the supply and demand landscape for transportation talent. Uh, this year, we'll, we'll be featuring a few fresh insights into wage trends by region for you as well. Um, but for those of you that have been, uh, been tuning in the past four years, um, I think what you'll hear today is kind of an exciting update on where we're at in terms of recovery from the pandemic and what the future is looking like. So again, my name is Erin Olson. I am the Senior Director of Strategic Research for Real-Time Talent. Real-Time Talent, for those of you that don't know us, is a public-private collaborative that's focused on aligning Minnesota's workforce. And uh, this year, our research analyst, Julia Diaz, took lead on compiling and writing this report series with the support of our newest research analyst, Catherine Jett. Unfortunately, Catherine is unable to be with us today, but Julia and I will be co-presenting um, the Pathway Insights with you, uh, for you. Uh, so Julia, would you like to say a few words before we begin? Yeah, thank you, Erin. Thank you so much, everyone. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for joining us today. As Erin said, I'm a research analyst with Real-Time Talent, and this is actually my second year working on the report. Um, so it was really great to take lead this year. Cassidy and Chris are really excellent to work with. So thank you both. Um, and thank you all for your time today. And thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, Erin. So as we go through today, we'll be presenting a lot of information and a lot of data. So if you're not a data person, it might feel like a lot. Um, I would say, you know, tune in to what uh, speaks to you, what resonates with you. If you have questions, please drop them in the chat. I'd also like to invite each of you to drop your name and the company or organization that you're affiliated with or the department that you're with at your college or university, if that's the case. Um, you know, just let us know who you are. Drop that in the chat. Uh, we'll, start, we'll start kind of the flow of communication going there and Julia and I will do our best to watch the chat and respond to questions in line as they come up. Um, hopefully we'll be able to reserve a little bit of time at the end of the presentation to do some Q&A, but we you know we've got six pathways to go through as you can see on the screen. So we're, we're gonna try to do our best to give you the highlights of, of what you should know about, about each of these pathways. So uh, today's presentation, of course, has an accompanying report, which includes about 20 pages of data and insights on each of these career pathways. Uh, you'll find even more information on what industries employ the, uh, this talent, talent demographics, specifics on skills, knowledge areas, tools, technology, certifications, et cetera, that are in demand today for positions in each of these pathways. So if there's any interest at all, I encourage you to take a look at those reports that are uh, posted on the Minnesota Transportation Center of Excellence's website um, and, and linked here in that QR code. So let's jump right in. First, the good news is that uh, as we entered into 2023, our statewide employment had reached roughly where we were at um, in terms of employment statewide five years ago, back in 2018. And a lot of our recovery happened just in the past year. Um, overall, employment in Minnesota grew, grew by over 60,000 workers. That's about 2% uh, growth between the second quarter of 2022 and the second quarter of 2023. So we saw a really significant rise in employment just in the past year. Looking back to 2018, which is shown here on the slide in that five-year history column, we saw employment grow by about 11,603 workers across all occupations. So we're like 0.1 percentage point higher than where we were back in 2018. So we're, we're kind of, we're rebounding, right? We're getting back, back up there. Um, over the next five years through 2028, overall employment is forecast to re remain relatively flat. Um, so we're, we're looking at like, as, as you can see in the, the table there, um, it's showing 0% annual change. So just, just a mere 1,756 new workers added to our workforce statewide, uh, very flat. Uh, transportation outlook for those transportation occupations, you know, it's just slightly more when uh, in terms of that uh, annual percent change that we're looking at, but still relatively flat, really only adding about a thousand additional jobs in the transportation um, sector statewide. Uh, so here you can see each of the six transportation career pathways, high level statistics on current employment, and that five year baseline forecast. Uh, the truck driving pathway still has that highest forecasted baseline growth, which was true last year as well now at 0.3% average annual growth. Um, it's higher than the state's overall average forecast, as you can see. By wage, aviation offers by far the highest average annual wages, uh, while collision repair is the pathway most uniquely concentrated in Minnesota to what we see on the national scale. Automotive technology is now the pathway with the lowest overall unemployment rate at 1.1%. We'll talk more about that in a moment. Um, and employment volumes in truck driving and marine and power sports are both higher today in Minnesota 
than they were five years ago. So we've seen like a very significant rebound there when we're looking at that five year change. It's it's pretty significant for those two in particular. So let's start uh, digging in to each of these pathways in a little bit more detail. We'll start by looking specifically at the automotive technology pathway, which has the second highest total employment among all transportation pathways. Looking ahead, we see a flat employment forecast over the next five years, yet given turnover at about 43% of positions held today will need to be filled by new talent during that same time period. Top industries in which automotive technology occupations are found include automotive repair and maintenance, automobile dealers, and architectural engineering related services. So now let's dig in with oh, a little bit more detail about the specific occupations included within automotive technology. Motor vehicle electronic equipment installers, mechanical engineering technicians, and mechanical engineers are all uniquely concentrated in Minnesota to a higher degree than what we see in the nation overall. On average, automotive technology careers pay about $68,300 per year. Um, we've, we've seen, um, it, and in comparison to the average wage overall, it, that's about $2,200 higher than the average wage statewide across all positions, so slightly higher on average wages. Demand has been high over the past year in automotive technology. We saw employment growth of 0.9% um, over that year. Uh, two occupations in this pathway have e either very low or zero unemployment, meaning that there are no unemployed trained professionals in that occupation. You see that right there, electrical and electronics installers for transportation equipment. We estimate that there's no available unemployed workforce to draw on um, in our state. Um, and um, about 89% of all people working in these roles in this pathway are um, employed by private employers. And then another 3.4% work for state, uh, federal, or local government. Um, Self-employment rose quite a bit this past year. We're at, we're at a four-year high in terms of the volume of self-employed automotive technology workers. 7.4% of this workforce is self-employed. Um, and that's kind of gone up from 6% to 7%. Now we're at 74 So seen kind of a steady, steady growth in that, that share of workers. Overall, we, there were about 5,000, nearly 5,500 new jobs advertised online, um, on online job boards um, in automotive technology pathway in 2023. That was down about one percentage point from the prior 12 month period. So we saw kind of a tapering off um, of, of those volumes. But as you can see, it, there was a lot of um, variation over the course of the year. Uh, we saw a kind of a spike um, in the early summer months, and then it dropped near the end of the summer, and then it, we saw a big spike again during the fall. Um, and, and so uh, volume of positions that were advertised by staffing and temp agencies in this pathway actually dropped pretty significantly. They were down by about 15% from the prior year. Um, and we, um, you know, when we take a look at things like the skill set sought in postings, there's, there's been a little bit of shift in that as well. All of that further information and analysis on the job postings can be found in the reports. We won't be able to dig into that level of detail in the presentation today. Uh, but if you're interested in the skill sets and some of the trends that we're seeing around job postings, um, please uh, take a look at those reports. Automotive technology entry level wages in the pathway um, in this pathway exceeded the average en entry level wages observed across all occupations by over thirteen thousand dollars. So entry level wages here are. Um, are, are quite high and are an opportunity for people that are entering into this field. Uh, really something to, to lift up and elevate for programs uh, that in comparison to entry level roles across many other pathways, there's, there's a lot of opportunity here to still get kind of that gateway occupation, like um, that hit that threshold for a livable wage for a household of three here in Minnesota within the automotive technology pathway. Um, it's important to call out here for, especially for those of you that have been joining us over the past few years to explore this data, that the wage information um, has a different methodology this time around. So um, if you're comparing to what the numbers looked like last year, um, you'll see a very dramatic increase in the wages. And that's because the way that the Bureau of Labor Statistics and our source, uh, Shermer Economics, has modeled that information has been updated. So last year's wage information was based on 2021, essentially. Um, now this is fully updated to that Q2 2023, and it's a slightly different model. So it'll look like there's been a huge change and there has been growth in wages, but it's not as much as it looks like on the page. So I just give you that, that caution as you're reading into this information um, by each occupation. One thing that was new about the wage analysis that we did uh, this year in the report 
is that we also gave a summary of the average and um, median wages and that entry level and experienced wages by region as well. Uh, wages in the automotive technology pathway vary across the three regions of rural greater Minnesota, urban greater Minnesota, and our seven county MSP metro. The MSP metro region has the highest wages across experience levels and percentiles and contains about 57% of the pathway's total statewide employment. Uh, greater Rural greater Minnesota region and urban greater Minnesota um, have very similar average and median wages. Um, you see very, very close, they track very closely to each other, uh, which is not always the case um, in, in all of these pathways. Sometimes we see a much greater range or variation from our, our urban and our rural communities in the, in the greater Minnesota space. Um, average um, automotive technology pathway wages in greater Minnesota regions are nearly $15,000 below the average pathway wages in the MSP metro. And so looking at those that that wage differential um, that may very well have um, also reflect uh, um, challenges faced with uh, attracting talent into roles and that wage competition um, is is something that, that can be very significant for talent, talent attraction into the field. Another way to look at wage trends is to focus in on job postings themselves. So looking at the median advertised wages for positions in each of these pathways gives us a sense of what employers are willing to pay talent now, whereas, whereas the wage data on the prior slide tells us more about the current wages of employees already working in the sector. So this is, this is more forward looking and like what employers are saying they might be willing to pay uh, for that new talent. And so here we see the posted salary range for automotive technology occupations in Minnesota as a whole during 2023 on the left and the three-year change in wages since December 2020 on the right. Automotive technology posted wages increased to an average $24.55 per hour, uh, seeing a 17.7% wage increase over the past three years. Uh, as you can see, the posted wages have fluctuated over that time frame. We had a, a pretty significant spike in late 2021 uh, for those posted wages. Um, but but overall, the trend, it, 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 there's not like a, a really a, a clear trend when you're looking at those wages visually. So while it's up 17.7%, that's um, still somewhat below overall average posted wages across all types of roles. Next, we'll take a look at the local talent supply of automotive technology talent. At an overall pathway unemployment rate of 1.1%, there are about 236 unemployed automotive technology professionals statewide. All roles have very low unemployment rates an additional 1,357 um, automotive technology professionals are underemployed. That essentially means that they are working in roles for which they have an advanced education or training background um, uh, than what is needed typically for that role. So the chart on the left here illustrates the educational attainment of all talent uh, that's currently holding an automotive technology role right now alongside um, then the unemployment and underemployment statistics occupation uh, by occupation on the right. So over a quarter of the workforce in automotive technology has a high school diploma or less as their highest level of educational attainment. That's about 6,800 workers. But a similar share of workers holds a bachelor's degree or higher. In fact, nearly one in 10 workers in this pathway holds a master's or PhD. So again, that's that points to that um, underemployment um, uh, piece. Uh, so actually under the automotive service technicians and mechanics, that's the occupation where we have the largest share of workers that hold an advanced degree beyond what's typically required for that mechanic role. And that's important because um, it might signal um, the possibility of individuals perhaps moving on to other roles or because they, they're overqualified or have other credentials beyond their current position that they're holding. So something to just take note of and consider um, in, from a, a career trajectory perspective, that there may be additional need to be looking at filling some of those roles um, and making some adjustments to, to draw in new talent to fill um, roles that may be, be opened up in the future. So um, now we'll take a quick look at demographics in our auto tech workforce. About 12.5% of the automotive technology workforce is under the age of 25. That share of workers is dropping. We're seeing yeah, I believe last year it was about 14% or just, just under that. Uh, so um, that's showing that the overall demographics of by age for this pathway are older now. 
Um, and about 4.5% are 64 years old. That grew as well from the prior years. So we have a lot, we have more older, older workers within this workforce than we've seen in prior years. Uh, the automotive technology workforce had um, also has, um, uh, you know, the largest share of, of the workforce by race and ethnicity is white, represents nearly 88% of the total um, pathways workforce, with the next largest cohort being our, our Asian talent, representing 5.2% of the workforce. Um, although it's not shown in this page, I do just want to speak briefly to post-secondary and college graduate demographics, because that is in the report as well. Uh, post-secondary program diversity varies by program across this pathway. Um, mechanical engineering programs, for instance, have the largest share of international students, um, and all programs have an over-representation of male students, uh, which matches up with what you see here for the overall workforce gender demographics. 95% of our workforce is male, um, and that matches closely to still what we're seeing in our post-secondary graduate pipeline. Um, so we also have information throughout the report on um, just more information on the, the programs aligned to each pathway. Uh, we've included, um, so there, I won't get into all the details of how pathways and occupations map to each other. There's this whole crosswalk for how things align. And suffice it to say that um, me many of the pathways here in transportation have overlap where you'll see multiple programs showing up on different pathways. So the pathways are very inclusive of multiple programs because we know that people's career trajectories are not necessarily linear. And there are many programs that uh, prepare people with related skill sets to each of these pathways. So you'll see overlap. Um, so they're inclusive rather than exclusive. Um, and so um, we, in, some, in some cases where our table was huge, we've refined that down to just give you the certificate and two year programs, but here, We've got for automotive, um, the automotive technology pathway, we've given you uh, kind of a broad look at, at all of the programs in Minnesota that exist aligned to this pathway. Um, in all, there were nearly 1,500 awards conferred at 27 different Minnesota post-secondary institutions um, in aligning programs. Um, among these, 358 were at the associate level um, and 333 were certificates that could be earned in less than two years. The average school had about 50 completions, but there was a range from two completions all the way up to 298 completions. And in fact, Hennepin Technical College had the highest number of complete completions of any post-secondary institutions in programs aligning to this pathway, representing just over 20% of all of the pathway um, related awards. So um, I know that was a lot. I won't be able to go into as much detail here um, in, in all of the pathways, but hopefully, that level of depth gives you a sense for, um, for the type of information that's here. In the next few slides, you'll see a very similar layout and I'll be lifting up those things that are most important in each of the pathways for you to really um, set up and take notice of. So next we're going to unpack aviation and uh, you might see it referred to as aviation drone on some of the titles here. And that's because uh, there it does also include that kind of drone technology um, tie in in terms of the occupations that are included here. Um, and so um, in all, about 9,370 people work in that aviation and drone technology pathway here in Minnesota as of the second quarter of 2023. That was a 6.8% increase from a year prior. So really significant growth in, in terms of total volume of employment. Um, here, as you can see, you know, right now we're sitting at a higher level of employment than we had prior to the pandemic. We've got more people in this pathway than we had before COVID. Um, but our forecast overall is looking relatively flat over the next uh, the next few years due to a very tight talent pipeline. Um, and uh, we anticipate that we will need to fill about half of the positions that are currently out there with brand new talent. So of the talent that we have, we're going to need to uh, fill many roles uh, uh, over the next few years, about four, just over 4,500 um, new workers will be needed to fill aviation roles that are held today um, that will be likely vacated due to job changes or retirements or other exits from the field. Um, again, here, uh, taking a look at the occupations of employment across, the, uh, across this pathway, uh, there's a wide range of different positions, aircraft systems assemblers, air traffic controllers and pilots, uh, cargo handling supervisors, for instance, these are all highly concentrated in Minnesota to a higher degree than we see in the nation overall. Um, as a whole, um, 
you know, the, the pathway is not necessarily highly concentrated um, uh, across Minnesota, but in the seven county MSP metro, we have a hyper concentration of, a, of all of the aviation careers that you see on this page. So it does vary very significantly region by region across our state. Um, taking a look at our job posting trends, this actually, um, so as we've looked at what's happened in terms of the fluctuation in demand for um, aviation talent since January 2022, as you can see, there's kind of a general trend line uh, moving upward. We've seen um, a, an increase of 27% uh, since 2022. Um, prior to that, um, you know, last year when we looked at this, it was 135% increase in job postings. And that was really in that rapid recovery of we saw such a significant dip during the pandemic. Now we're starting to get back up to kind of a more um, uh, a consistent growth, similar to with what we would have seen back in 2018 um, in terms of the volume of jo um, job postings. Um, there was a relatively low uh, number of job postings for um, in relation to the number of people being hired. For every one job posting on the market, there was about one hire that was made. And so uh, we're seeing that... Um, you know, kind of, uh, you know, not over, um, not over advertising for the positions necessarily, not having a lot of, a lot of evergreen positions on average across this pathway. Um, but it's, it's, uh, it's looking relatively stable at this point in, uh, in time when it comes to the, um, the signals that the online job marketing market are giving us. The aviation and drone pathway overall saw weight, um, Wage um, averages increase from prior year's estimates, though, of course, we have to take that with caution given the changes in methodology um, year over year. Entry-level wages in this pathway far exceed the average entry-level wages observed across all occupations statewide, paying an average of $80,800 on average annually for that entry-level talent. Um, and education and training requirements vary from occupation to occupation in this pathway, everything from a high school or GED requirement to a um, bachelor's degree requirement, depending on the role. Um, so you can see those in the far right column there. Um, so half of these occupations also require at least moderate on the job training. So there is that on the job training component that's so critical to these positions. By region, um, quite, the, quite the range in, um, in um, average wages. And these, again, this is taking us back to that that average wages of uh, individuals on the job right now, currently working in aviation drone um, careers. The MSP metro region has the highest wages across experience levels and percentiles, while entry level wages in rural greater Minnesota and urban uh, greater Minnesota are close. Uh, wages vary um, as you look across this table. Um, and certainly there's that gap between uh, the MSP metro and what we see in greater Minnesota. Um, however, this difference in wages is not necessarily a huge surprise since nearly 80% of all jobs in aviation are concentrated here in the Seven County metro area where, where I'm sitting today. Um, so it's, um, there's a hyper concentration here in the metro it's where we've got the majority of our positions. Um, so, um, and it's where, you know, we've, we've got the, the MSP airport as well. So, um, not a significant surprise. So it's really interesting though, when we look at job postings, um, median posted wage across you know, all jobs that were advertised in aviation and drone, uh, the average wage was about $22.46 per hour. Uh, we had higher volumes of those um, lower wage jobs in job postings. So we're seeing kind of like a higher volume of the most entry level roles uh, being advertised and those occupations with the lower um, wage sets were the ones that are advertised. However, if you look at the chart on the right, we saw really significant growth um, in terms of the wage, uh, the posted wage among those even lower wage um, occupations that were advertised in this pathway. So up about 41% uh, from January 2021 here. At an overall pathway unemployment rate of 1.5%, we only have about 135 unemployed aviation technology professionals statewide. Um, and again, we've got we've got a, a significant share of underemployed individuals, primarily under the aircraft mechanics occupation. That's where we see most folks with more advanced credentials than what their current job requires. And as you can see, we've got a really large share of aviation talent that have that four-year degree 
or even higher than that. So a very different picture than what we saw for our, our automotive technology talent across Minnesota. Um, so a different type of pool um, of talent. So taking a look at the demographics of the workforce, the share of, of workers under the age of 25 has increased from the prior year. So we're kind of flip flop from what we saw with the other pathway. We've got a younger workforce now in aviation than what we've had in, in prior years. And the share of talent over the age of 64 has decreased uh, to about 3.8% of the workforce now. Largest demographic group by race are white, representing about 88.5% of the workforce. That share increased by about three percentage points from last year. So we're seeing more, um, a greater share of the workforce that is white for our aviation pathway right now. Um, and the, um, the next largest cohort is our Asian talent, representing 5.5% of the workforce. Um, about 4.1% of the workforce identify as Hispanic. Um, that's an increase from last year. That's pretty notable. Uh, last year, we reported about 3.3% of the workforce. So we saw a pretty substantial increase in our uh, Hispanic and Latin uh, workforce. And that does have overlap with the race um, uh, grouping as well. So it's likely that there's overlap with some of that increase in the white talent that we, we um, just um, lifted up as well. Um, digging in to aligned post-secondary programming, um, so here we have about 728 awards conferred at 30 different post-secondary institutions across the state that are aligned to the aviation and drone pathway. Um, here we've kind of trimmed down the table to just show you what's that kind of associate or certificate level completions um, by program SIP code. So you might find at your local um, institution, they might call it by a slightly different name than what you're seeing on this page. This is sort of the standardized program names. Um, the, the, the program with the highest number of associate degree completions is that um, automation engineer technician, um, and then followed by um, the electrical and electronic communications engineering technology role. So there, here, this is where that important piece about drone, drone technology kind of ties in. So it's not all just aviation programs here. There is that broader look about all the technology that sits behind um, um, career paths that are tied into aviation and drone. Moving forward to collision repair, uh, this will be my last pathway before I pass things over to Julia. Um, so this, this pathway in particular, you can see is something very similar in terms of that trend line from what we saw in aviation. Um, we are now well beyond our employment pre-pandemic, um, so really significant recovery. Um, over the past couple of years. In all, about 7,307 people work in collision repair roles in Minnesota. Um, and um, we're forecasting relatively uh, flat flat outlook. We'll, we'll likely see uh, a decline in overall uh, volume of employment over the next five years under our current uh, supply of talent. Um, here in Minnesota, uh, we're going to need to replace about 47% of positions currently held in collision repair with new talents. So we've got a significant amount of replacement demand that we need to also um, address. We um, This is the career pathway with the highest location quotient. Um, that essentially just means that we have a, um, a higher concentration of these jobs here in Minnesota than a typical community nationally. We've got about 10% more. So it's not, it's not a significantly high higher concentration, but we've got about 10% more collision repair professionals here in Minnesota than a typical community nationwide. So it is worth lifting up that out of all of the transportation career pathways, this is the one that that shows up um, shows up the most um, in terms of local concentration. Our unemployment rate in this pathway is a little bit higher than what we've seen for some of the other pathways so far. We're at about 3.1%. That translates to about 227 people that would be skilled and trained in collision repair careers, um, but not currently working, but seeking work. So that's actually a pretty small talent pool when you think about it um, at a statewide level to draw upon for these positions. So of the three occupations found in the collision repair pathway, it's the coating, painting, and uh, spraying machine setters um, occupation that's uni most uniquely concentrated in Minnesota. Um, so with um, you know, about 16% more of those roles here than a typical community statewide or nationwide. Um, about, um, 
about 91% um, or so of workers in this pathway work for uh, private employers. We've actually seen that percent, like the share of um, uh, share of the workforce dropping quite a bit. We're seeing um, growth in self-employment um, as well as government employment. And interestingly, it, for this for this pathway, so starting to see some shifts in terms of who's employing um, the collision repair talent as a share of the total total pathway employment. We saw an increase in the volume of online job postings uh, in 2023 compared to 2022 with uh, nearly a thousand unique job postings you know, deduplicated um, posted across the state this past year. Uh, there are about three hires for every one unique job posted. Um, and that essentially means that we have more evergreen postings, maybe positions that employers are putting up and leaving up and just making multiple hires off of that one posting because they have a constant need for that talent, perhaps. And so um, kind of important to uh, recognize that dynamic and that difference in how job postings are being used um, and, um, at, at, and how that signals demand in a different kind of way. On average, collision repair careers pay about $52,800 per year. Um, and that's about $9,600 below the average wage statewide across all roles. Um, and um, all positions in this pathway typically require a high school diploma or GED and either moderate to long-term on the job training or an industry credential. These positions in this pathway all classify as what we would call gateway occupations at real-time talent. They're middle wage, middle skill position occupations in local demand with skill sets that prepare talent for higher wage roles that uh, would require more advanced education or training as well. So these kind of hit that threshold largely of that kind of living wage threshold for a household of three uh, based on um, Deed's um, living wage calculator, if you want to look, take a look at that. Um, but again, there, there is some variation region by region. Um, kind of tracking back again to our, our analysis of rural greater Minnesota, urban greater Minnesota, and MSP Metro, how that, how that shakes out um, in our state. The MSP Metro contains just over half of the jobs, so about 54%. That matches up pretty closely to the local concentration of jobs in all industry pathways. So there's no unique concentration necessarily of collision repair roles in any particular part of our state. They're pretty relatively spread out um, evenly in our region. But as you can see, those average and median wages, um, there's a little bit of a difference there. Um, the differences in those wages also track pretty closely to the, the differences in wages across all occupations. So there's um, the, the lower average average wages in urban or rural greater Minnesota um, track very closely to the, the, the difference in, in wages that we see across all occupations. So there's nothing kind of unique about those wage gaps here for collision repair. Um, necessarily compared to uh, all types of jobs. Taking a look at, at the posted wages in this pathway, we see um, or the median hourly rate uh, advertised in most positions at just over $25 per hour. Uh, we've seen overall uh, wages increase by about 22.2% uh, since uh, January, 2021 here. So you can see that trend line kind of um, steadily rising uh, for this career pathway. Um, the next slide, we'll take a quick look here at the uh, levels of education of collision repair talent. You can see that the largest bucket of talent that um, in terms of highest level of educational attainment is um, at that high school diploma or GED level. That's where we have the, the greatest volume um, of talent here. And then um, it's a pretty, um, pretty uh, clear just kind of curve that tapers off uh, for a certificate or two year um, or for some college, two year, four year and beyond. Um, there are about 177 people um, that we estimate would be skilled um, in this area but are currently unemployed. Highest unemployment rate is among coding machine operator uh, talent. Um, that is also the occupation that has the largest share of underemployed talent uh, where they're maybe much more highly skilled or trained have higher education level than what that occupation requires. Um, and about, and more than two in five professionals, again, two in five professionals have that high school diploma as their, um, as their highest level of education. Um, that, um, that really is one of the notable features of this workforce in comparison to some of the other um, pathways within transportation. Um, by demographic here, about 8.7% um, 
5% of the collision repair workforce is under the age of 25, and about 5% are over 65, um, over six, uh, 64 years old. Um, that um, we've actually seen the share that's in that oldest age cohort increase pretty, pretty significantly the past couple of years. It increased by 1.5 percentage points from last year's analysis. So, um, so a little bit on um, on the the older side uh, in comparison to prior years of analysis. Uh, and taking a look by race and ethnicity um, after the demographic. Um, the group that is white, about 88.6% of the workforce, it's our Black and African American talent that comprise the next largest group for collision repair with about 4.6 of our statewide workforce in collision repair being Black or African American. 10.1% um, um, identify as Hispanic or Latin A. That was an increase of about 1.7 percentage points um, from the prior year. And about 10.8% are female. Um, that rose actually pretty substantially um, by about 4.5 percentage points from a prior year. So we've seen some some movement there in terms of the um, the demographics by gender uh, for the collision repair pathway uh, just in the past couple of years. So that's really worth taking note of. And finally, um, when uh, taking a look at that that one program that is directly aligned to collision repair, auto body collision and re repair here in Minnesota, we've got a total of about 154 um, awards that were conferred in the 2022 school year. 31 of those were at the associates level, um, but we have a good number of certificates here, which really aligns closely to that workforce need that we uh, that we saw and, and really um, kind of responds to that, those um, education level um, attainment um, um, slides that we saw where, got kind of two and five with that high school diploma. Uh, the next step there for career advancement is to obtain that certificate or associate's degree. And so that's really where we see a lot of the activity and where that um, uh, the auto body technician programs really add a lot of value. All right. So as I pass the floor over to Julia to continue, I want to just um, say again that uh, we will be able to take, um, you know, I know Julie has been responding to some questions in the chat. I'll be taking over for her there. So please continue to drop your questions in the chat and we'll do our best to respond to them as we can. Um, so thank you. And Julia, take it away. Thanks, Sarah. Yeah, thanks everyone. So moving on to the diesel equipment and trunk truck pathway, <clears throat> occupations in this pathway range from bus and truck mechanics and diesel engine specialists to earth drillers, except for you know, oil and gas. So just a wide range of occupations included there. In all about 12,161 people work in this pathway and forecasting future needs uh, does look like it's going to decline by 0.1% uh, over the next five years. That is down from last year's um, estimates. And it is primarily concentrated in the machinery, equipment, and supplies merchant wholesalers industry. And that has increased slightly from last year. And it does have the highest location quotient or concentration of roles in Minnesota among the transportation pathways. And looking at replacement needs, about oh, nearly 50% of positions held today will need to be filled by new talent in the next five years. So getting into more specific uh, details in, on these occupations in the diesel pathway, of the seven occupations in this pathway, farm equipment mechanics, excavating and loading machine and drainage operators, and bus and truck mechanics are uniquely concentrated in Minnesota to a higher degree seen in the nation overall, with farm equipment mechanics, I believe, having the highest location quotient of all of the occupations included in these transportation pathways, as you can see, just very dramatically locally concentrated in Minnesota. On average, diesel careers pay about $64,200 per year, and that is nearly $2,000 lower than the average wage statewide across all roles. And most of the occupations in this pathway have very low unemployment rates, um, really as low as 0.2%, and that's uh, at excavating and loading machine operation, operators. About 84% of people employed in this pathway work for private employers, while an estimated 4% are self-employed. That's pretty similar to last year and the remaining work for government entities. Thanks, Erin, sorry. 
Um, so overall, there were um, and it, there was an increase of 36% of unique job postings with an average of three hires for every one unique job posting. So as Erin alluded to, what that's kind of signaling is that there are um, more hires happening with just one job posting. That's kind of signaling a need. Um, okay, thank you, Erin. Sorry. So they... Um, these crews did see wage gains across the pathway with average raise, wages rising about $2,300 from prior year estimates. Um, and again, recognizing that the year over year wage comparison is not perfect, but just wanting to acknowledge that. Uh, entry level wages in this pathway exceed the average entry level wages observed across all occupations in Minnesota, paying an average of $47,300 for entry level talent. And education and training requirements do vary slightly across the different occupations with all occupations typically requiring only a high school equivalency um, and zero to five years of work experience. And all kind of, again, requiring that on the job training to different degrees. So in this pathway, wages do vary across the three regions, um, it, including rural greater Minnesota, urban greater Minnesota, and the seven county MSP Metro. Um, as we've kind of seen across the pathways, the highest wages are, um, across experience levels and percentiles are in the Minneapolis Metro. And with just under half of the statewide employment being in the Minneapolis Metro, that's not super surprising. And the urban greater Minnesota does have a slightly higher average annual wage than rural greater Minnesota. So here you can see uh, on the left posted wages and those have increased um, to an average of $31.38 per hour as of 2023. And that's a pretty um, solid increase. Last year is a little over $28 per hour. And you can see the fluctuations um, in, rate, in wages over the last three years on the right there, having increased by just over 15%. So with an average uh, unemployment pathway, pathway unemployment rate of 1.3%, there are about 153 unemployed uh, diesel professionals statewide. An additional 745 diesel professionals are underemployed. And again, that's meaning that they are working in roles for which they are overqualified by education or experience. Uh, the highest being for bus and truck mechanics. More than two in five professionals hold a high school diploma as their highest degree. And again, um, kind of similarly from what we've seen, you can really see that uh, curve there happening. There are um, more that do hold that to your uh, degree level though than um, a four-year degree or um, a certificate level. Looking at demographic data for the diesel pathway, about 10.5% of the workforce is under the age of 25 and 5% 5 are over the age of 64. More of the workforce in 2023 is between uh, the ages of 25 and 44 than in 20, 2022. Uh, similar to 2022, the largest group, demographic group by race um, are white, representing 91.7% of the total pathways workforce. And the next uh, largest cohort is uh, those who identify as two or more races. Um, and then just over 5% of the pathways workforce identify as Hispanic or Latina, and less than 2% are female. There were 256 awards conferred at 14 different Minnesota post-secondary institutions and programs aligned with the diesel pathway uh, in school year 2022. Among those, 106 were certificates that could be earned in more than two years, but less than four years. And no programs were delivered remotely. So moving on to marine and power sports pathway, this is the smallest of the transportation pathways, but does have some significant talent needs. About 60% of positions held today will need to be filled by new talent in the next five years. And the industry that has the top uh, employment in this pathway is owner of, excuse me, other motor vehicle dealers. Yeah. Of all of the occupations found in the marine and power sports pathway, aircraft service attendants, Motorcycle mechanics and outdoor power equipment and other small engine mechanics are uniquely concentrated in Minnesota to a higher degree, degree than seen in the nation overall. And on average, uh, careers in this pathway pay $48,700 per year, 
and that's up from 46,000 last year. So it's a pretty substantial wage increase. That is, however, well below the average wage statewide across all positions. Overall, um, job postings increased by 55% from the previous year. And again, you can see here a larger number of hires uh, for every one unique job posting. And Marie, as I've kind of alluded to, Marine and Power Sports saw some significant wage gains across the pathway with average wages rising by $2,500 from prior estimates. Entry-level wages exceeded the average entry-level wages observed across all occupations in Minnesota, paying $5,000. Uh, over $5,000 more, uh, paying an average of $37,900 annually for entry-level talent. And as we've seen across different pathways, entry education and training requirements do vary slightly across the different occupations in this pathway, with most occupations requiring either a certificate or high school diploma or equivalent. Only one of these occupations requires previous work experience, and that would be motor boat operators. So wages uh, in this pathway do, again, vary across the three regions um, with the Minneapolis Metro, again, having the highest uh, wages. And again, that makes sense with over half of the statewide employment being in the Minneapolis Metro. There was uh, little to no difference between urban and rural greater Minnesota wages and the wage gap between urban greater Minnesota and the Minneapolis Metro median wages is almost $8,000. So posted wages interestingly remained the same in 2023 as compared to 2022 uh, for that hourly wage. And you can see again on the right here, the three-year wage trend line. Um, and you can really see how it has just bounced all over the place over the last three years. So I think that's really interesting. So with 159 people unemployed at 3.7%, and 485 underemployed in the marine and power sports pathway. That unemployment rate has, um, it does vary across the occupations with the highest falling for auto and watercraft service attendance. Uh, the number of underemployed decreased slightly um, this year, which is telling. And the table again on the left illustrates the educational attainment of talent um, for marine and power sports. And again, uh, as we've kind of seen across a number of the pathways, nearly two in five professional school to high school diplomas are highest degree. And interestingly, 7.2% do not have a high school diploma. Okay, so moving on to demographics for this pathway. Uh, it's remained really relatively young and fairly consistent over the past three years about 19.8%, so that is an increase of 3.5 percentage points from last year, uh, of this workforce is under the age of 25, and 6.8% are over the age of 64. And that is an increase of 2.2 percentage points. Um, so again, not uh, necessarily aging, it does remain quite young, but you can see again those increases in the older age demographics potentially signaling an aging workforce. Uh, the largest demographic group by race are white, representing 83.5 percentage points, and that did decrease by almost two percentage points from the previous year. Okay. There were about 216 awards conferred at 11 different Minnesota uh, institutions for this pathway. Uh, there was, interestingly, in uh, the 2022 school year, one less post-secondary institution with completions for this pathway. And the 85 of those completions were at the associate level. So moving into truck driving. So this pathway does have the highest total employment of all transportation pathways by a factor of five. So uh, 97,603 97, are employed. It does have the highest baseline average annual growth forecast at 0.3%. Again, so that's remained consistent. However, it is the most vulnerable set of entry level occupations just due to technological and innovations in transportation. And about 63% of positions held today will need to be filled by new talent in the next five years. 
And in terms of top industries, the top industry of employment in this pathway is general freight trucking. So industrial truck and tractor operators are uniquely concentrated in the state of Minnesota as are shuttle drivers and chauffeurs by 40% and 35% respectively. respectively excuse me. And uh, about 86.2% of people employed in this pathway work for private employers. That has actually increased by almost two percentage points, which is interesting because we kind of observed a number of other pathways saw that percentage decreasing in previous years. Overall, there were um, 18,506 new jobs advertised in truck driving roles in 2023. And this number interestingly did decrease by almost 15% from the previous year. And again, seeing more hires uh, per single job posting. Annual wages rise by about $600 uh, per, from prior year estimates. Entry-level wages in this pathway exceed the average entry-level wages observed across all occupations in Minnesota by just over $5,000. And um, education and training requirements, again, do vary across occupations in this pathway, most requiring a certificate, um, excuse me, heavy and tra tractor trailer truck drivers requiring a certificate, whereas other occupations in this pathway typically require a high school diploma or equivalent or no education requirements at all. So again, um, over 50% of uh, the um, statewide employment is in the Minneapolis Metro. And that there is again, little to no difference between urban and rural greater Minnesota wages. There is a just over $3,000 wage gap between urban and greater, for urban greater Minnesota and the Minneapolis Metro wages. So wages increased by, um, almost $2 per hour from prior year estimates for posted wages, hourly wages. And again, you can see the three-year trend lines there on the right, seeing uh, wages increase by almost 19% since 2021. So uh, unemployment rate for this pathway did increase uh, from 2.6% last year to 3.3% this year. There are about uh, 3,300 unemployed truck driving professionals statewide and an additional uh, over 13,000 underemployed truck driving professionals. Um, again, you can see that over two, two in five professionals hold a high school diploma as their highest degree and 8.3% do not have a high school diploma. And there you can see that there is a uh, closer um, similarity between uh, having a two-year degree and a four-year degree, which I think is interesting. The truck driving workforce on average is older um, than that workforce as a whole in Minnesota with 6.8% uh, of the truck driving workforce being um, under the age of 25 and 8.6 are being over the age of 64. And that percent did increase um, by two years from the private prior year estimates. Uh, again, largest demographic work, uh, group by race are white, representing 83% of the total pathways workforce, with the next largest cohort being uh, black talent, representing 9.5% of the workforce. And I do want to note that uh, the female percentage for this workforce did increase by 1.5 percentage points from the previous year. So there are a total of 61 uh, degrees conferred at three different Minnesota post-secondary institutions. That's down from 84 in the 2021 school year. So I recognize we are at time, but I just wanna say thank you so much everyone for your time today. And if you do have any questions, please feel free to email uh, either Erin or myself. I'll drop my email in the chat. And I just, want to say thank you again so much for your time um, and I really appreciate you taking your lunch hour with us. Chris? Thank you Aaron. Thank you Julia and Cassidy and everybody that's online. I really appreciate it. Um, there's a couple of really good questions that are in uh, Joel especially in the in the chat and there are uh, there's a lot of data here and there's a lot of questions and we welcome although we're running out of time we are welcome to those questions and we can actually help you out with 
maybe some anecdotals based on the data of what we see and connecting. And again, if you're an industry partner and you want to connect with the Minnesota State Campus or a college transportation program, please let us know. Um, mintran.org is our website and our, all of our contact information is there. Everything is downloadable. This recording will be available very soon as well. So again, thank you everybody for the great day. Thank you, Real Time Talent for the partnership. We look forward to doing this again. And once again, have a great day. Thank you, everybody. Sorry, I was just hanging on to see if anyone had any last questions, but it looks like we're good guys. So yeah, I was always I was doing the same, just hanging yeah, on. Yeah, I was like just again. just making last sure. Second, but, mm -hmm. Last second questions. Okay, well, thanks yeah. again, guys. Really appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Thank you Absolutely. so much, Jenny. I know you're listening, so thank you again. Tell Deb we said hi and thank you again, and we'll talk to you soon. Sounds good. Yeah. Thank you. So you I'll, I'll be in the car driving next week, but on Tuesday morning, but I'll be able to okay. listen and talk. So. Great. Right. Talk soon, guys. Sounds good. Thank you. Thank you all.